and gentlemen, I hope everyone is doing well today. I was looking for some suggestions in the comments as to what everyone might want to um, what everyone might want to go ahead and sketch. I'm hoping that there's not an echo. I think everything is, oh, I see what's wrong. Okay, we're good, we're good. I accidentally had the video playing in another uh, in another box. That's fun. All right, so um, what I have underneath the microscope right now is a stonefly adult. I thought he, she could be, he or she, I'm not sure what gender it is. I thought that it could be a, uh, a really cool thing to talk about today because not only is it a unique order, it's a minor order, so it's, you know, none of the big ones. It's not a fly or a beetle or a butterfly or a, um, any of the major orders. This is a plecopteran. I also um, have a couple of fun stories about stoneflies because I collected them when I was very young and they have a part in um, stream ecology and river health management and all types of stuff. So knowing what these guys are and being able to see them and identify them is actually kind of cool to know, to be able to kind of know something about your local streams and rivers. Um, on a completely bonus side note, while, um, before we really get going, I wanted to give you an update on bugs I have, live insects that I have, because, you know, why not share them? So, over here, I have, let's see, I have a brand new carpenter ant colony, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited. So, we're not going to see her all the time because she needs to go into a dark place who's, which is undisturbed so that, you know, she can take care of her brood and I can stop messing with her. But... Um, I love her so much that I've been wanting to take pictures and video of her, so I haven't put her in her dark hideaway place yet. Um, so right here, that large ant in the center, that's our queen! And our queen still doesn't have a name, but we have, um, we have a couple of front runners that we're working with, so if you have an idea of what we should name her, you can go over to our Facebook page and vote. Um, we have all of these little workers here. She has about 11 workers, and, um, she does have a small batch of eggs. And so this is her kind of brood box, and then she's got a tube to an outworld. And this outworld is where, um, the workers are going to go and collect food and stuff. So that's what that looks like. This little... This little itty bitty cup right here was actually the very bottom of a um, of a plastic tube, and so I just trimmed it off and made it a little ant cup. And so now it has just enough honey in it for them to be happy. They actually it had probably double or triple that last night, but they ate a lot, so I'm gonna have to give them even more. So that's kind of fun. I wanted to share you guys, share with my ants with you guys. Okay, so. Um, after chatting about ants and all of those wonderful things, I figure we can get started. I might have... We have a couple people here. Yeah. Alrighty. So, um, let me know if we have a, ever have any problem with the video. It's, it's yelling... The live stream is yelling at me, but I think that it looks okay. Alright, so we're going to be sketching a stonefly today, um, and this is a perlid stonefly. Um, I identified it back long ago when I was um, taking an aquatics class, and I was just looking for those notes to give you the actual characteristics of what defines a perlid. Actually, I see the book right now. I'll be right back. I have my notes from my aquatics class. So um, I'm going to be able to look it up really quick and then let you guys know 
the characteristics for this family. So when we're looking at stoneflies as a whole, let's see, it's under the microscope so we can throw it over here. When we're looking at stoneflies as a whole, they generally are going to hold their wings over their back flat, um, like this. And they generally are also going to hold their bodies very close to the, to, to the substrate that they're on. So whether that is a, um, so whether that is like uh, the side of a wall where they've landed or a leaf, they always kind of hug really close to their substrate. Um, you can kind of see that also with how their legs are situated. Uh, they are going to have completely aquatic nymphs. So as immature stages, they spend all of their time in their water. And so this, um, this fella, stoneflies, are generally collected um, near water or near, near a water source. And not only just near any water source, but a lot of times um, stoneflies are found near clean and healthy water. Um, they're pretty sensitive as immatures, so when, um, if there's a lot of pollution in a water body or if the water body doesn't have moving water, like if it's stagnant, if it doesn't have a lot of oxygen in the water, you won't have stoneflies. And so, um, stoneflies are kind of an indicator of good water. Cool. Found it. Let's see. Perlids. <laughs> the paraglass is larger than the glossa. And they have plant branched thoracic gills. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. All right, so we'll be able to flip over this uh, this stonefly and check out its um, thoracic gills. A lot of times in the adults, we'll still be able to see kind of remnants of those gills, which is kind of fun. Um, my professor used to say they have armpit gills. And so when you kind of take them out of the water, um, if you take them out of the water and they want to kind of create more um, oxygen or maybe they end up in a pool of water that's a little more stagnant than they would wish, they take their legs and they can kind of pump themselves back and forth and they'll push water over those, um, over the, essentially their armpit gills. And um, that's going to be how they can generate more oxygen to breathe. So, um, for our nature journalists out there that want to go ahead and sketch along with me, um, we're going to be measuring our stonefly from head to the end of the tail. That is about 2.5 centimeters. All right. Alrighty, so um, she's about 2.5 centimeters. She's a perlid, so we can go ahead and start getting on this guy. Um, it is a. Oopsies. Broke my pencil. So this this little this little friend here is a stonefly. Um, it's in the order Plecoptera, and then this individual is in the family Perlidae. But I haven't identified it past family yet. Alrighty. Yay for sketching. Alright, so we're going to start up near this head. I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in on the head.
so I am going to attempt to draw my stone fly significantly smaller than I've been drawing insects previously because I keep running off the pages and I really like to stop doing that. Um, so I'm going to try and draw my stone fly a little smaller. That's fine. All right, I'm going to give myself this nice little arch. This is the back of the head. This is where I this is where I like to start a lot of times. It gives me a place to move forward and backward. And the size of the head will um you can base the rest of the size of the body on. Um so I'm just going to go ahead and sketch this head real quick. A lot of times you've got this arch. The front of his head is a little more flat because it is kind of flat vertically. And then um, we can go ahead and add the eyes. And there is this little shelf at the base of each of the eyes. So when we're sketching that, we can just go ahead and kind of give it an L that comes in and goes out and then build that shelf out just a little bit so that you've got a little more shaping on the head. And then you're going to do the same thing on the other side. So find where that L meets and then bring it out just a little bit further, bring it back in, pull the eye down. There you go. We've got a head. Um, now we want to look at kind of where those antenna connect right here and here. So we're going to look at kind of the base. I'm going to end up probably expanding my, extending my head just a little bit. So we have the bases of these antenna, and the antenna come out, that first segment is kind of wider. You can see, um, maybe if I focus a little further down, yeah, that gives it a little bit more in focus. You can see that the, the, the actual head kind of protrudes a little bit, and then this is kind of where the first segment is. And stone flies are going to have these long, straight, um, straight antenna that almost look like hairs. So when you're sketching them, um, these are actually fairly long. I guess to be able to see how long they are, we've got to zoom out a little bit to see the entire length of the hairs. Or of the antenna. All right, so you can see that's about the length of the antenna, and if we kind of zoom it forward on the head, the antenna is going to reach, if it was pulled all the way back to the back of the specimen, the antenna is going to reach probably, probably about half the length of the entire insect, so probably just till about after the hind legs trying to give you a little bit of a scan of the insect. I really like the cool wing venation. We'll have to look at that later. Alright, so that gives you an idea of the length of the antenna. They are fairly long. Um, so my antenna, uh, let's see, they're probably just going to barely fit on the page. If I imagine that this is kind of the head, maybe I will actually wait to do the length of the antenna until after I've got some more of the, um, until after I have some more of the body done so that I can kind of tell where it's going. 
I feel like I really like the left side, but the right side's a little off. I'd like to figure out what's wrong with it. But um, let's go ahead and look. We do have we do have two ocelli on our insect's head. So not only do we have these two large compound eyes, but we have those two small little red simple eyes. They are right here and right here. And those are called ocelli. They like to help them see not really shapes and colors, but they help them see light. <clears throat> um, the next segment down is this one right here. This is the pronotum, the first segment of the thorax. A lot of times in other insects, this can be a shield that guards the head that kind of expands forward. But in these guys, their head protrudes in front of their pronotum. It does come out. Um, the thorax also, in general, is going to have a very square kind of boxy shape. Um, the reason is because a lot of times in the thorax is going to have all of the muscles um, connected to it because it's where all of the um, it's where all of the legs are connected and it's where the wings are connected. So your thorax is definitely going to be kind of more boxy. All right. Let's see. So we have that pronotum. That's that first segment. And the reason that you can't see any more segments is because the front pair of wings is connected to the back end of that first of right here. So th this is where the wings start. Um, you'll notice that they don't um, start completely even, so you want to come in just a little bit and then come out. Make sure that there's that little bit of a constriction right there. And then um, with these wings, I think that we can kind of see it from this angle. They sit on top of each other like this. They sit on top of each other flat. And so um, this on the left side is on the top. It goes from here and it wraps all the way around to the other side and then it comes down and around. Um, whereas this one goes over this way, but it's going underneath. So we can see kind of the edge of that wing coming over here. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch these wings. Alrighty, and then coming back through and kind of looking at how this wing is kind of like this, and then more like that. And then I just went in and gave this a little arch because it's how the, the wing would fall and lay. And there's a little bit it comes out just a little bit. Yeah. So that's going to be our overall body shape for our insect. We've got head, eyes, antenna, the pronotum, and the wings that are all visible from the dorsal view. Um, going back in and adding um, colorations and wing venations and things like that is going to be fun. Let's see. We've got this central line in the pronotum. I just want to make sure that that comes out okay. Alrighty. And then I do want to add our, I do want to add the legs. And we might as well add the legs on both sides because she has, um, she's able to view them from both sides. And there's no really way to kind of open her wings and show one side of her wing, right? Um, so we might as well let her, let her see, show off both of her legs. Now, um, I'm going to zoom in on the left side. It looks like it's a little more um, flat and ready for sketching for our viewing pleasures. The first pair of legs is on that first segment of the thorax, right? The thorax is broken up into three segments. The pro, the mesa, and the meta. All right, so this um, this femur 
connects into the coccy that's right about here underneath the body. So when we're, oh, got to turn on my camera. Alrighty. So when we're sketching this guy up here, we're going to be sketching a leg that's kind of like this. And you'll notice that the leg is actually fairly close to the eye. So I might even make my, let's see, might make my pronotum a little higher up, closer to the eye. Maybe a little less of a curve. And then connect the leg, yeah. That's gonna be a little better for this side. Um, so getting that leg back, this first segment of the leg that you can see, this is the femur. Now, um, insects have similar legs, right? We've got a femur, a tibia, and metatarsals. Insects have a femur, a tibia, and tarsi. It's good to make sure that you come down to this angle right here. That's going to give you the ability to connect the tibia fairly easily. And then the tarsi, or my little stonefly's toes. This helps them hold on to walls. Stoneflies are actually a really fun one to catch, and you see them not only... Um, you see them not only at water during the daytime, but if you are a um, fellow bug lover and have ever gone blacklighting, the stoneflies will actually come to a blacklight. So, um, a lot of times when I'm collecting these stoneflies, it's from having had a light set up looking for other guys. Let's see. This one was collected. This one was collected in Jackson, Michigan. So it's likely that um, this specimen was actually collected at a gas station. I used to do a lot of um, gas station and like and um, they call it kind of island hopping, where instead of setting up your own black light, you go from location to location, like. Um, like storefronts and gas stations and bank parking lots and you collect the insects that are um, being attracted to the lights. Um, I generally carry a permit when I am collecting but things like collecting out of a gas station parking lot um, generally if you ask they don't care. They're like yes take as many of our bugs as they as you want. Um, yeah. I've only ran into the cops a couple times collecting insects. Um, actually, on my last road trip, I did run into one very nice police officer man. Um, <clears throat> I had been driving home, so it was at the end of like a four-week road trip. Um, I had driven from Philadelphia up to Lansing and then down to Arizona. To, and I collected every night. I saw the Grand Canyon. I went on hikes. I sh set up tents in the desert. Like, I was up on a place called Wing Mountain. Um, I had a great time. Uh, and then when I was driving home... I was getting a little tired and I wanted to collect bugs and it was nighttime and I have definitely collected at this place in the past because I remember going there. I'm driving off, I'm driving on the expressway and I see this wonderful group of beautiful lights um, and it's a car dealership and I'm like, wow, the bugs there must be awesome and it's the middle of the night. Um, so I figure I'll just pull off the expressway and turn around and I'm gonna go and see if I, see if there's any bugs with these really awesome lights. Um, <clears throat> and so 
I go and I'm looking and I'm collecting and there's awesome bugs and I'm mostly I'm mostly staying on the sidewalk that's outside of it. Um, but the bugs are like flying down and landing on the sidewalk and there's beetles and sphinx moths and I was really excited. So I had like a little vial and I was collecting stuff and I had um <clears throat> I had stuff to dispatch moths with and I was going at it, right? Um as it turns out, there are motion detectors, and I must have stepped over the line once or twice to collect a beetle off of a car. You know, one gets excited. <laughs> and so, um, there were motion detectors that, set, that got set off, and I ended up with a cop pulling up and asking me what I was doing. I'm like, I'm an entomologist. I've been on this long road trip. I collect insects. I'm doing it for education. Here's my, um, like, documentation. Um, but, you know, I actually was holding a sphinx moth at the time when he pulled me over. And, um... Or he, like, pulled up, and I was trying, I was in the process of taking care of it, but then I was talking to a cop, and then I needed to do other things, and then he asked me to leave. So instead of taking care of my moth, that, that individual sphinx moth I don't even think is spread yet, because it didn't end up getting properly saved. Um, it was so pretty. But, yeah, the cop just let me go. He was like, hey, just, you know, make sure make sure you stay on the sidewalk next time if you're collecting bugs and stuff. And I was like, all right. Um, but the last time that I went to that, because I had been to that um, dealership before and collected, and there was not, um, there was not motion detectors the last time I went. <laughs> so, be careful. It's best to just set up your own bug light. But they normally just laugh it off as long as you're doing it for science, recreationally, you know. Stoneflies, so a lot of times we talk, when we talk about um, insects, we say that the front leg moves forward and then the back, the middle leg and the hind legs point backwards. Um, but you'll notice that this stonefly has its middle leg point pointed forward, and that is actually going to be common for these individuals. Um, and that's because stoneflies um, are in that crouching position, right? They kind of crouch, and so their knees go backwards and their hands and their little tarsi go forward. Um the first leg had one little tarsal segment and then, like, told two tarsal segments and then the pad and the claws, whereas the middle leg is actually going to have three, so it has two triangles at the base and then one more. If I want, we can actually zoom it down a little bit further so that you can kind of, yes, so you can kind of see a little bit better. All right, so I'm going to make sure that this tarsi or that this tibia is a little bit wider. Alrighty. And then I've got two little tarsal triangles. And then the tarsal pad with two tarsal claws and the little guy in the center. Alrighty. And we get to do that exact same thing on the other side. And try and keep it as even as possible, because insects, like all other arthropods, are symmetrical. Most of the time. I would say definitely their body shapes, um, their body shapes are always um, symmetrical. But every now and again, you'll have color patterns that are not. Um, especially if that color pattern is a little random. Um, I have a domino cockroach that his back right spot actually looks like a little rubber ducky. And then the hind legs are going to be moving backwards. Um, let's go ahead. I think I'm going to have to flip this one over to be able to see that. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Make 
Maybe we won't flip it over. Maybe we'll just put it on its side. So this is the leg. It is kind of tucked underneath the body a little bit, but we'll be able to kind of imagine it pulled out and we can compare its tarsi from this side to the tarsi from the other side. So we can kind of imagine it all of the ways. Um, this right here is the femur and then we've got the tibia and then the little tarsi all the way over there on the end. Um, it looks like this back leg might even have four because you've got two triangular base tarsi. Oh, maybe it's just the three like it might just be the three like the middle leg. Let's look. No, it has one extra. All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and sketch these hind legs. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skip sketching the tarsi, but I, um, because my legs are going to go off the screen. Next time I will draw the head smaller. I say that every time. I really try. I promise. Alrighty, so we've got, I have femur and tibia. Um, the tarsal segments, if you are sketching them, I'll just draw a little circle and draw one set. So um, the tarsal segments at the end, if you're talking about kind of the end of your tibia, you have one that's almost kind of this heart or pad shaped, another one that's this heart or pad shaped, and then um, we've got kind of this longer one with a bonus little triangle with two hooks at the end. So that's kind of what our our last handful of segments look like on our um, on our stonefly's hind legs. So there is a little bit more detail and kind of cool things happening here. I'm gonna write tarsal segments. that belong there. Alrighty. I think that we have the ability now. We've got a lot of the uh, a lot of the body done. I can go back and check on how long these antennas should be. Alright, so we have, there's the antenna, and kind of imagining it down pretty much to where the, the femur ends. We're going to leave it on the wings. So I've got one. You're going to try and make it nice and thin in the beginning, and then it gets a little bit wider until the very end. 
This is a, f um, probably what they would consider almost a cetaceous, a cetaceous antenna because it's kind of more hair-like rather than just being a straight antenna. All right, and then try to get it even on the other side. Which for me is going to look like that because it's going to go off the page. That's fine. All right, and then um, we've got the only thing really left are these wing venation sections. Um, we do have a couple of things to check out. So right here, this is the vertical line that kind of runs exactly with the body, and then this is a little bit extra kind of on top of it. So if we're imagining it, there's a line that kind of goes straight. And then this is kind of the extra that goes over and, and drops down. Um, and then we have this base cell right here at the base of the wings that all of these other veins kind of come off of. So I'm going to go ahead and get a cell that's kind of like this shape. And then... Um, even one more little cell that is going to come in this direction because then you've got the, um, then you have the vein that comes off of this edge and the one that comes off of this edge and then the center. And then this front edge goes all the way pretty much to the bottom. And then if we are coming right about here, there's one on this edge that comes down. And one final one that comes that is right here that comes off of here. Alright, so we've got all of these kind of main veins done and then we can go ahead and add this these, this cross hatching right here. I don't see as much of those cross veins on the other on the other sections, but definitely this one where it comes off of the square, it's going to have a number of cross hatches. And we're gonna go ahead and zoom um, we're going to look further down at the wing and check and see if there's any, yes, if there's anything else happening down here. So this gets complicated, right? All right, so let's look at it. Um... There is cross, um, there is many um, cross veins right here between this first and second one. So this very small edge that we have that runs along the side, you're going to want to give some of these over there. That gives some stability in the front of the wing, and it also kind of gives the lip or the edge of the wing. Um, here we go. We've got this guy right here. We've got this lady right here. And so this long one actually ends as kind of a longer cell. That is this right here. And then it breaks off a couple of more times in the other direction. And so these guys start going that way. Um, so they don't come all the way to the bottom. they'll actually start coming off in the other direction. Looks like this one has like three or four, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just kinda gonna give these guys little breaks at the end. A 
it's easier when you see um, it's easier when you pull one wing right now we're looking at kind of um, we're looking at the layer of wings so that can make it a little bit more difficult awesome sauce so that is my stonefly um, well at least that's the dorsal side of my stonefly my stonefly can be turned over and I want to show you the characteristic for perlids or for this family of stonefly adults. When we flip these guys over, they actually are going to have these little tufts at the base of their legs. Or scars from the tufts. We're going to see. So I'm thinking right about here. So they're not as easy to see as I was hoping, but that is them right there. Those are little scars from where the tufts would used to come out of their exoskeleton. That's where they would have breathed from as immatures. That's where their gills were. Um, the other characteristic on perlids is that their paraglossa is larger than their glossa. So I believe that that has to do with, oh, look at mouth fingers with those guys. Um, we might have to view it this way. Where are stone flies? Um, stone flies can be found um, all over the United States for sure, but I think that they can be found um, over most of the world outside of Antarctica. Um, they are a um, they're off, they are a freshwater insect, so they like to spend their time near rivers and streams. Um, uh, this is a river behind me, but they wouldn't live in a river like this because stoneflies really need to have fast, like, cold running water um, because they need the water to be full of oxygen to be able to breathe. Um, so this is an adult of a stonefly who would have been living in a stream or a lake. Oh, right. I was like, where did my perlid note go? I actually have it printed this time. Oh, right. And that that's the characteristic for the immatures. Yeah, so pretty much with the adults, I know that they have those gill, um, those gill scars, but other characteristics for this family I'm not sure about. Um, the fun thing about stoneflies is that stoneflies... Let's see, if I was to draw kind of a kind of a quick sketch about the rivers, um, we've got insects that are these stoneflies that had thorax and abdomen, and the stoneflies will generally have two tails. And then you've got an insect called a mayfly that looks very similar a lot of times, but instead of having two tails, they'll have three tails. And so these are mayflies. And then the third one are caddisflies. And these are insects that a lot of times, but not all the time, will make themselves kind of a little nest out of a out of leaves or sticks or rocks or sand, whatever they have around them. They use their silk from their mouth glands and they make this little home. And then this insect can can filter feed or it can be predatory depending on depending on which individual it is. Um and so we have 
May, uh, stone flies. Mayflies. And caddisflies. And the three of these together, if you find all three of these together in a river, um, you can you can say that over, the overall health of the river is likely pretty good, as long as you're finding lots of all three of them. Um, stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies are on those list of insects that are generally a little more sensitive to things like pollution, um, lack of oxygenated water, and um, kind of like stale environments. So when you're seeing these guys, you'll also find a lot of fish, because fish love to live in rivers that you find stoneflies and mayflies. You, that's also why a lot of times um, uh, fly fishermen, right, their fly fishermen are going to tie lures and tie little flies that look like stonefly larvae or mayfly larvae. Um, they even make like little groups of feathers um, for the gills under their body so that um, when they are fishing for when they're when they're fishing, uh, they can kind of trick the fish into thinking they've got one of these three insects. Um, so they are used uh, for by the Department of Water to check water quality. They're used by fishermen to catch fish. They've got all types of fun things, and we call this the EPT scale. Um, so stoneflies, the order name for them is Plecoptera. Mayflies, um, the order name for them is Ephemeroptera. And caddisflies are Trichoptera. And so between the three of them, they, ha they are EPT. And you can do all types of ratios um, and math with this. This um, with biomonitoring, it can get really complicated depending on um, water quality and, and organic material and the individuals that you're finding and the width of the stream and the amount of light available to the stream and all of these things um, kind of come together to create an environment for these insects. Um, yeah. So when you find the adult stoneflies, you're likely near a good quality water source. Um, the stoneflies will also come a lot of times at nighttime to lights. Um, and mayflies too, in fact. So mayflies will emerge in huge numbers and they can take over an environment very quickly. I actually witnessed a mayfly emergence once where, I forget exactly where I was, but it was along one of the, one of the big Michigan lakes. And, um... I, we ran into this mayfly emergence. We were driving into the town, and the town was completely pitch black. None of the lights in the town were on. And that's weird, because a lot of times they have all of these street lights and the city lights, and all the lights are on, right? The city is normally on. Well, the whole village had turned off. There was no lights on anywhere. And we were like, wow, this is a little creepy. Like, what is happening? And so we, um, we start noticing all of the mayflies on the road and more mayflies. And by the time we realized what it was, there were like hundreds of thousands of mayflies. They were covering everything. There were mayflies everywhere. And I'm sure I have pictures of it somewhere. Um, you could hear them. You, you, we got out of the car and walked around a little bit and collected. But you could, like, hear them as people were driving by. They were making the road a little slippery. And the reason that the city had turned off all of the lights was because they didn't want to attract more of these mayflies. So instead of having the lights on for the city, they turned everything off and just hoped that they would find another source of light somewhere else. Um, so that's mayflies. They can mass emerge. And when they do, they mass emerge all at the same time. And then they only live like two or three days. And then they all die together too. And then you have a big mess to clean up. Yeah. Mayflies can be a little bit of a pain. But having them means you have fresh water. So worth it? I think so. You get some, you get some, some buggies like that. All right, so um, look at that. I got lots of people hanging out. Um, we just sketched this really beautiful stonefly. I was pretty excited about her. Um, we could even look at 
I really like its its palps right there. Those labial palps that are coming down from its mouth right here. Those are really cool. Almost worth sketching. I could probably even just put them on the front of this guy. Two short ones. And then two longer ones that are a little more central. Yes. That's what this head was missing. He needed his mouth fingers. He looks much better. I love it. That makes me happy. All right. So, um, that is my stonefly chat today, along with a little bit of water, um, and stream, stream knowledge. We could continue talking about this if you wanted to talk about, like, we could talk about the river continuum concept. Alright, so there's this thing called the River Continuum Concept, and it stands for RCC, and the idea is at smaller streams, like streams that are very thin, the ones that are running through mountains, those types of things, those are kind of a, what do they call them, level or ranks? One. Essentially, they are a first order. They're called a first order. Um, they're a, f a first order stream, right? So it's like the beginning of a water system. And then when two first order streams merge into one, they become a second order stream. And then when two second order streams merge into one, they become a third order stream. And this goes on and on, right? So you can have um, these streams turn into giant rivers, right? And each one of these orders um, has kind of almost even different rules to them. So when you've got these really, really base streams that are kind of thin and they've got um, not as much water running through them, you also have, you generally have vegetation all the way up to the edge and lots of leaves and sticks and stuff that are leaning over it. So up here at the top, we have a lot of, um, a lot of um, coarse organic material or like we have a lot of sticks we have a lot of sticks and leaves um and all of those types of things in here now um in the water that's going to change what type of insects that we have right so we always have about 20 percent predators one in one in five of my aquatic insects is generally always a predator in the system um but then, and now I'm not going to remember all of the percentages, but um, I can tell you that at the base, you have something that are called shredders. So these are insects like um, crane flies, crane fly grubs, that are going to spend all of their time breaking large sticks and large leaves, and they can eat those, all those guys up. There are a number of mayflies that do this. Um, and they'll shred all of this stuff up and they'll send um, send material along, right? And so shredders are going to take all this coarse material and turn it into what we call fine particulate organic material, which is um, their whatever they let leave over from processing. So they turn all these larger leaves into smaller chunks of leaves or nutrients that they pass on the stream. Um, and so as you go down the system, you end up at the bottom where you have these huge rivers. Think of like, um, I don't know, here we have, here we have the Delaware River. Um, and this is a huge river and likely has lots of buildings right all the way up to it um even and even if it did and even if it did run through a completely natural area it's still very wide so it's receiving a lot more sunlight it's receiving less um sticks and twigs percentagely right so it doesn't receive as much of this 
this really coarse organic material. It's mostly lots of fine little particulates, right? Lots of little small microbes, lots of small little algae stuffs, all of those smaller organic materials or um, anything that they passed on from these um, first order streams. So what we have down in um, higher order streams is instead of having this large chunk of shredders, the chunk of shredders is really small and we get what we call filterers. Filters. Yeah, so these insects are going to be filtering smaller particulate, smaller organic material out of the water. Um, a really good example of this is an insect called a black fly. They look a little, um, as a mature stage, they look a little bit like bowling balls. Um, but they have this mouth part that looks like this. And it's really cool. And so if you should totally look up this wild um, insect, there's some YouTube videos of them. But they have these crazy fans up near their mouth. And they'll fan these um, their mouth parts kind of through the water. And they collect little organic pieces. And then they clean these fans and they eat everything that gets caught. And so that's, um, that's one type of really fun insect. But also they will, um, they will also mass submerge and they're black flies, so they bite. Um, and people don't like them. So they have a cool way that they eat, and you can find them in these higher order streams or higher order rivers a lot of times. People don't really like them. They tend to be around cities because the cities are around the water. You know, we don't really get along. But it's a cool process. Um, caddis flies, there are a number of caddis flies that also are filterers. Um, there is a caddis fly, and the filterer caddis fly isn't as sensitive as the other ones. Um, but they'll find a little rock, and they'll put up a little net. It has two kind of stronger pieces of silk, and some very light silk in between them. And then they will sit there on a rock and kind of just stare at their net. And then as the water flows through, it's actually collecting all of this fine organic material. And then the caddis fly, once its net has collected enough stuff, will just go and eat the entire net with all of the things on it and rebuild a new net. Um, so he goes, nom, 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 nom. And then it's gone. Um, but that's uh, caddis flies and a little bit about the river continuum concept, kind of how it works. It's kind of the overall view, right? So this is a concept as that, that kind of describes how the insect community changes as the water and the and the rivers change, right? So these rivers, they're not only, they're, they not, don't all look like this, covered with duckweed with very, very small, um, with a very, very light flow to them. Some of these smaller river streams, some of these smaller river streams can be um, very, very, fairly fast moving. And the, um, that's what the stoneflies really like, is they like all of that fast moving, highly oxygenated water to rush over their gills so that they can breathe and be happy. Sometimes stoneflies are predatory, but um, there's, uh, there's a number of different jobs for them. Alrighty, that's a little bit about that. I love, I love aquatic insects and getting into this type of stuff. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a thing. So, um, thanks for hanging out with me guys today. Uh, I'm seeing that I've got a couple of people hanging out with me right now, and so my question to you is, do you want to look at another insect on their microscope and sketch it, um, or should I be done for the day? Because I just kind of, it's a really good resting point for me, or if you guys would like, we can keep going. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Jody. I'm glad that you're still hanging out with me. Um, I think it's I I love the, the I love water concepts and and using insects to determine water quality is definitely something that I've always found really really fascinating. Um, I started learning and leading small groups of people collecting aquatics when I was like 13. So. Um, been doing this for a little bit of time and just absolutely love every time I find a new bug. 
I actually have some cool video of a water penny I saw recently. <laughs> yeah! Welcome! I'm glad you're here live! So normally you come back and watch them afterwards? So I have these two other insects that I had pulled out of my collection just in case someone wanted to sketch another one. Um, this uh, fella on the right, see if it'll focus. There we go. This fella on the right is an eastern eyed click beetle, and that one on the left that's a little tiny, um, it's a native ladybug. Are either of those in, um, uh, interesting for you guys to sketch? Oh, the cicada was fun. We did that last time. Um, I really liked I really liked that one too. Very, very good. And I love that um I love that especially with the cicada that we sketched um that we sketched together, I love that there's also a matching cicada killer for it. That wasp that we sketched. That was fun. We can look at the little native ladybug under the microscope. I think she's pretty cute. She actually might be pretty fast to sketch. We probably could sketch her in about 30 minutes. Especially from the top. Um, because you can't see a lot of her other features um, until we turn her and look at her head. Um, Ladybugs have small three segmented antenna. Ladybug! Perfect! So, um, this is a native ladybug. I. I feel like if I looked this one up, I probably could give you an identification. This one was collected in Michigan. Yep, yeah, that's what I thought. It is the spotted pink ladybug. Okay. I'll get you the scientific name for it. All right, so what we're looking at here is the spotted pink ladybug. Um, she was a brighter pink color when she was collected. Her coloration did fade a little bit. So she's a spotted pink ladybug. Keep in mind that um, when you write ladybug, you want it to be all one word because she's a beetle. She is not a true bug. If, if a ladybug was a true bug, you would want the two words separated. Um, and if you write lady beetle, you separate those two words because she is a true beetle. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the rules for the rules for that. Um, all right. 
And um, ladybugs, all ladybugs are in the family. I'm going to give you her family, too. Might as well. Um, all ladybugs are in the family coccinellidae. All right, so the native and the non-native ladybugs, all of them. And then the species that we're going to sketch today is Coleo megilla maculata. So, C-O-L-E-O. M-E-G-I-L-L-A Maculata M-A-C-U-L-A-T-A -A. Maculata is a common epithet in um, insects and I believe it means spotted Modeled Yeah. Marked with irregular blotches. I think that that describes her pretty well. Her blotches are pretty irregular. Sometimes this middle spot right here will expand a little bit down and it'll look like that they have an upside down heart on their back. And that's pretty. All right. So, Coleo McGill. La Maculata. That, I typed the scientific name in the chat box in case it's a little, in case it's hard to read on, from my screen. All right, so we have the overall view of our insect. I'm going to go ahead and just give myself a light outline of kind of the overall shape before I get started. This is hopefully going to help me in the future not make my sketches too large like I do. And then I can always go back and add detail and change things as I need it. So that's a very light outline, but that makes sure that I stay on the paper. There we go. All right, and I'm going to make sure, let's see. I'm going to pull this ladybug over here really quick, and we can go ahead and throw it, give, give us some measurement. This lady is approximately uh, 0.6. 0.6 centimeters long from the head to the end of the abdomen. Is it true that the number of spots are the age of the ladybug? No, that is not a true fact. There are a lot of odd um, ladybug, uh, there are a lot of uh, things said about ladybugs that aren't exactly true. You also can't tell that there. You can't tell the gender by the color. Um, there are ladybugs of all number of colors. So when you have a when a ladybug emerges from its pupal case, um, when a ladybug emerges from its pupa. And it starts to harden its elytra. It starts to harden its outer shells. It's going to have the same number of spots when it's born as when it dies. Because they don't have the ability to kind of change their body form after they become adults. So whatever they're born with, that's what they get. And when you see a ladybug, like a like ladybug beetle, like a lady beetle, um... When you see them, they're adults, right? So adult insects don't even have the ability to grow anymore. Um, so uh, they don't even... So a lot of times when you see a small one, you're like, oh, it might be a baby ladybug. Actually, it's just a ladybug that when it was a baby didn't get much nutrients. So it's, it's small forever. <laughs> So that's a little bit about ladybugs. Um, ladybugs are predatory, right? So the United States, there's a bunch of scientists that said, hey, let's bring the multicolored Asian lady beetle over and they'll help us with our aphid problem. We all know how that worked. Um, the Asian lady beetle has now kind of taken over 
You can find them everywhere. They're in people's homes. But we did that on, scientists actually did that one on purpose. They thought that they were bringing this insect over to help farmers when they actually were creating a pest. All right, so that gives me a little bit better of an idea of the shape of the head. I was having a hard time with that one because I knew it was a little thinner than what I was giving it. Um, or I knew it was like shaped differently. So I wanted to make sure I got it right. This guy it comes up just a little bit. And then he's got, if you look at him in the right direction, you can almost see those little mouth parts, those little, those little predatory chewing mouth parts. And you shouldn't be able to see huge compound eyes, I don't think. But maybe we do. Maybe that is what we're seeing. That is totally what we're seeing. All right, her compound eyes are here. She does have decent sized compound eyes. That little, that little appendage right there, that's one of her labial palps, her mouth fingers. Yeah, so the multicolored Asian lady beetle is not native. It's from China. So how you can tell the difference between a native ladybug and a non-native ladybug is, I'm going to, this is, you know, the kid's version of the ladybug, right? So you've got the pronotum and some spots. All right, but what you're looking at is if you look up here at the pronotum, um, the multicolored Asian ladybug, the invasive one, it has an M on its back. And we call it M the MALB, that's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Um, but that's how we determine that's how we determine the invasive one versus our native ones. So our native that we are looking at right now, um, she has these two little spots on her pronotum rather than having an M shape. Let's see. So this is her pronotum right here. And she is also a little bit differently shaped, right? So she has this little bit of a constriction. You can see her head more um, than in a lot of other ladybugs. She's still a ladybug. It's just that I, I feel like people, when they see the spotted pink ladybug, because she has this kind of longer body shape than they, than they would recognize a ladybug to have, they'll they say, well, that's not a ladybug. But what you're used to seeing is you're used to seeing most of the ladybugs being this species right here. And so you show them something different, and that's not exactly what they know, right? All right, so we've got these two larger spots. I'm just going to go ahead and kind of see if I can get them close. Um, she's uh, maculata, right? So her, her spots are not um, always perfectly symmetrical. All right, um, beetles in the center line. So if you follow this center line of your pronotum down here to where it meets your elytra or these wings over here on the edges, um, you're going to have a little itty bitty triangle. It's right here between the wings, and that's called the scutellum, and it's important. So we get to sketch it in. So you follow, oh, I made it a little off to the left. So you follow that center line, and that's going to be your point for your scutellum. Yeah. I 
was really excited because um, I had thought that most ladybugs in my region, or had known that most la most ladybugs in my region were either a red or an orange or a yellow color, right? So there was one time that um, my mother had my mother had given me a ladybug pupa. She was like, "Hey, I found this crazy looking insect thing on the piece on on this branch." And I collected it for you because I thought you would like to see it. And I was like, oh, cool, you know. Uh, and as a dutiful, you know, thought I was like, thank you so much. And in the back of my head, I was like, it's a ladybug pupa. I see them all the time. But, you know, I was like, that's awesome. And I kept it in the little vial that she gave it to me. And I raised it, you know, I made sure that it stayed moist um, so that it would emerge. And it was the most beautiful ladybug I had ever seen. It was blue. My mom collected me my first blue ladybug. And she didn't even know it was going to be blue. Like, none of us did, because we saw it in its pupil form. And as it turns out, it's called, like, the ash gray ladybug. Um, so it was this cloudy blue color. It was... It was blue, but it was like a cloudy blue, like um, like the color of the sky when the storm is rolling in. Um, it was gorgeous, and I was really excited. So then I had to call Mom back and be like, thank you so much for collecting this ladybug pupa. The ladybug is blue. All right, so I'm giving myself this center line in the elytra, and I believe... Yeah! Yeah! I was surprised myself. I wouldn't have believed it if I if I hadn't seen it, you know. But they exist out there. You can look them up. I think they're called the Ash Gray Ladybug. Yeah. A lot of these pictures on the on on the website show them to be like a pale blue to almost a white color, but the one that I had when it was fresh emerged was like a striking blue. They're almost this white kind of iridescent blue. Yeah, they're beautiful. You can look them up. All right, so we've got our elytra, that little scutellum triangle. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give us our dots. Um, keep in mind that you can even see that like this dot's a little wider, this one's a little thinner, so across the border they don't have them exactly even. Um, but she also won't have her dots going all the way up to the edge of the elytra. You can see that. There's always this little orange border around all the edges. So just go ahead and you can go ahead and add these dots. Um, she's always going to have them in generally the same spot, though. So, um, like, one that's sharing on the center, one that's over here on the edge, the wider one. And when I'm doing these, I just kind of shake my hand a little bit so that I, I'm making sure that they're kind of um, not, not even lines. These ones on the edge are a little smaller to leave for the, the room for the center spot here, and then two more on the ends. That's really cool. I like that. We did good. I'm going to go back through and just add a little bit of graphite to each of my spots, and I'm going to smudge these in. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to do this. So that my ladybug has a, little, a couple of darker spots on her. And then I can even go back in and erase around the edges so that the spots come out a little stronger. So that we've got some light patches in between these spots. Look at that. Okay. Um, now uh, we can go ahead and add legs. I wonder if we just add the femur and the tibia. 
like she has them instead of making them outstretched. so that we can see her legs. Honestly, I think that the blue ladybugs have got to be pretty rare because um, it's the only one I ever saw. I've not seen another one since. I do not have that specimen anymore. I would like to find another one. Or I would have already showed it to you guys, I promise. <laughs> After telling you the story, I probably couldn't have helped it to have shown you. over here I'm looking at I'm looking at tarsal segments I'm counting legs I'm kind of seeing which ones we're gonna be able to sketch from I'm gonna look up really quick the tarsal formula for coccinellids that's what I thought appears to be three 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 that's what I was seeing I just wanted to make sure that we were all good with that. All right, so um, our tarsal segments are going to all appear like they have three tarsal segments each. So it looks like this one has one, this one is two, and this one is three. And they're all the same in this way, okay? So they're all going to have these three tarsal segments that you can see. Now over here, this leg is going to be the best one that I can show you this on. Um, our, our tarsal formula is actually 444. There is a hidden tarsal segment that um, you can miss really easily. And scientists and other people who are trying to identify ladybugs, um, they miss it so regularly that people say that the tarsal formula is apparently 333 when it's really 444. All right, so we have one here, two here, and three here. But um, between the second and third tarsal segments, right here, kind of in between the two pads, there is another little itty bitty micro segment in there that's really hard to see, but I promise it's like right there in between these, this kind of fork tarsal segment. So that's kind of um, fun about ladybug tarsal segments is that they kind of trick everybody. They appear to be 333, but they're actually 444. Yeah. I love all the hairs on the bottom of her body. Those are definitely going to, um, I wonder what they help her with. All right, so our first pair of legs is connected up here, and it's going to push forward. So we're going to have our femur, our tibia, and then our tarsal segments are going to be one kind of rectangular one, one that looks like a heart. It has those two individual pads, and then the longer one with two claws because it's going to look like it's three. And we can go again. <laughs> My left leg got too long. I need it to be stouter. All right. 
Alrighty. The other thing that I would really like in my collection, I don't believe I have a dogbane beetle right now. And dogbane beetles are absolutely gorgeous, and I've collected them a number of times. So my goal is to see if I can raise them in captivity this year. I think that that would be fun. I've had dogbane beetles through uh, the egg laying process, um, but I haven't ever gotten the um, the grubs to survive. They, the, the grubs are interesting with dogbane beetles because instead of feeding on the leaves of the dogbane like the adults do, the dogbane grubs will hatch out of their eggs, fall to the ground, and they feed on the roots of the dogbane. So they're a little bit more difficult to feed because you actually have to grow a plant in, the, in their tank with them. But... It would be totally worth it to be able to have a, a dogbane beetle colony because they're a native species, so I would be allowed to have them without any, like, worry of permits. And they are absolutely gorgeous. I think they're the prettiest beetle. That's a native to here, at least. Chrysina Gloriosa might beat it, but those guys are in Arizona. That doesn't count. All right, so we have our ladybug. Dorsal from the top. I added its legs in. Admittedly, you're not ever going to see all of these legs splayed out like this. Um, so naturally, your ladybugs, if you're going to see anything, are going to be more... If you are trying to draw them in a more natural stance, their legs would probably be more like this where you can see the femur and then the tibia, but the tibia actually is going to go kind of underneath the insect. Um, so this would be more like what you would see naturally. And this is when you pull the legs out because you want to be able to sketch all of the pieces. Um, the other thing that I think could be fun to see on our ladybug is the front of the head. trying to see all of the mouth parts before I move it forward because I want to be able to see anything that's kind of tucked up underneath here. Yeah. Okay. You know when you look at a bug and you're like, what is that little piece there? <laughs> Need to clean my microscope again. It gets so much use doing these illustrations and doing classes. I absolutely love it. Okay. So 
what we're looking at here See, what I'm confused about is this little piece right here. It looks like it could be the mandible, but from the underside, it looked like the mandibles were closed. So what else would that be? Oh, it's the antenna. It's the antenna. It's wrapping around the head. That's why we why, why I was getting it all mixed up. The antenna starts about here. It wraps around, and that is the small club. Um, ladybugs have short clubbed antenna. Alrighty. Now I can get to sketching. I understand all the parts. <laughs> So this ladybug actually does have some pretty decent eyes. Pretty, pretty, pretty large. Let's see. I'm gonna draw the top of the head way up here at the top of my box. Give myself as much room as possible. I'm um, gonna go ahead and give myself the internal and the circles for the compound eyes. And then I'm going to go ahead and connect that head. That's going to give it so that we've got a little bit of eye that moves further away from the exoskeleton. Kind of gives us that little bit of separation. Um, we do have that kind of fun little stripe going through the center of her, center of her face. So we can always add that. Um, and these, I guess the stripe actually comes down a little bit wider because... Um, the um, outside is kind of still black and it comes down maybe to around underneath the eyes where the antenna is going to be coming out. Right, so the antenna comes out from about here and it has a number of segments between here and here. Um, I wonder if I zoomed in any further if we could count segments. Nope, not far enough. Might be able to do it in the microscope. No. Nope. Uh, it's about four. My gut is saying about four. From here to here, and then the club. But you can always add something like Trisha's gut says, or hypothesis, or not sure about the number of segments, you know, but we do know the shape. We can see that it's the stalk, that there are multiple segments in here, and then that it has this kind of fun looking club at the end of it. And we can do that twice. And I believe... I can't really see it from this angle, but I believe that the club is broken up into three segments. I think that ladybugs have a small three-segmented club. That's one of the characteristics of a family. Um, and then the head, or the, the rest of this face, it kind of protrudes forward in this way. Um, so we've got this coming down, and then... something funny like that. He, he's a little duck build, huh? Um, maybe a little less, but let's see. This is about where the labrum starts. Yeah. So this is kind of where that upper lip starts. This is the labrum from about here to here. This one right here. This one is the labrum. It's this little kind of um, front lip up here. And then she has these mandibles. And the mandibles come in from angles on either side. And they go underneath. Um, she's She is also going to have little itty bitty mouth fingers. They're probably going to be three segments each. Um, those can be seen from underneath the 
Just two, I think. She might have four, but I think right now it's just about two. Um, and you can go ahead and the darker area is this area up here. So if you wanted to add a little bit of graphite and smudge or color, however you are sketching your journal. And I'm going to make sure that I come back up here. I forgot to give her this coloration. I think I made her head a little bit too wide up here, but that'll be fine. Cool. That's fun. I like to cross hatch in the eyes to give it that um, impression of that impression of being like multi part. So just some hashes, some hashes this way, and then some cross hatches. Cool. I think we did good. I think this ladybug is awesome. The spotted pink ladybug, a native. One that we, when we see it, we smile and we're super happy because it's protecting our gardens and feeding on aphids and um, probably fighting with ants and all types of stuff. So I've seen a number of ladybug releases. Uh, just make sure that when and if you do go ahead and release ladybugs in your backyard, they are ladybugs that are native and don't have this M on their pronotum. This M on their, the front. And this is like a shield that guards their head, right? Because that's not actually their head. So I can say their front or their top. Um, I can just call it the pronotum. Alright. Is there anywhere else on our ladybug that you really wanted to see? Anywhere else that you really would like to sketch? I think I'm closing in on dinner time. All right. So I just want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for hanging out with me and joining me while we sketched both. Oh, man, we had a longer day today. We sketched both this really awesome stonefly and the family Perlity. We got to check out its little tarsal claws, and we talked about how its wings stacked on top of itself. We got to sketch and chat a little bit about the river continuum concept and the different insects that you can find as you're going kind of through this, um, through different types of water bodies and different widths of water bodies. Um, and then... We flipped over to ladybugs. So we actually got a lot of stuff done today. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I even kind of turned the, some of these legs so that they look a little bit more natural. This is going to be how you see them when they pass and how you see them. They'll also kind of pull their legs in if you scare them, right? So if you scare them, they'll pull their legs in and drop to the ground in hopes that you miss them and you don't eat them. Um, I do want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Always make sure that if you're not already to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you can get notified when and I, when I'm doing this and when I post new ones. And if you hit the little notification bell, it'll even ring your phone and say, hey, Trisha's live, come join her, right? So you can go ahead and do that. Um, I am on um, I am on Instagram and I play this game called Guess That Bug where I post pictures from my microscope at 10, 12, and 5. And then um, I have people that come on and kind of guess what insect it is. And then 5 o'clock is when the answer comes. And then up here, this is where I teach out school classes. Um, so this is where I teach students, um, less adult classes and more classes for kids 5 to 8, 9 to 12. I even teach, um, uh, YouTube video editing classes for teenagers. So, um, you can always check that out. All of these links are in the comment, are in the description below. Um, this right here is a QR code just in case you want to tip me for the class today. Um, or if you'd like to buy me a coffee, just a 
a couple bucks or whatever you'd like. Um, it really does help. This is what I do for a living, and so it's it's nice to get a little bit of that. Um, but no worries, obviously. I just like to say that it's there if you want it, all right? Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me, and I hope to see you again next week. Um, I loved the ladybug too, Jody. I think that that one was pretty cool. Um, I mean, I have to figure out what we're, what we're going to sketch next week, even. <laughs> yeah. So, um, thank you so much. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. The next time I'm going live is Thursday at 10 PM, but you can always just come back next Sunday at four. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Bye.